Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11057 Introduction to Law. This is week eight of term two, 2019. We're getting down to the business end. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, we're getting very close. I want you to remember something that I'm sure I mentioned to you in the first week, and that is the way in which that you should think about being a lawyer, being a law student understanding that stress is going to be a part of the study, start part of practice, um, if you practice as a lawyer, or indeed in many other pursuits that you might use your law degree within. Keep a cool head. If others are losing their head around you, don't react, don't overreact, and just work through the problems and through the issues. If you need to lose a bit of sleep, lose a bit of sleep. But don't stress over it, just embrace it and think this is, um, you've worked hard to get to this stage, to be enrolled in the university degree and to be enrolled in this unit. So um, embrace that, enjoy that and accept that stress will be part of it. The, the second assessment piece, correct me if I'm wrong, is due Thursday week, the 19th of September, week nine. Is that correct? Good? All right. If um, you're listening carefully to what I say, um, you'll be probably at the stage where you're just about to finish that assessment. Now, some of you may say, no, I'm not even close, but I guess I'm talking about an ideal situation. So as a rule of thumb with your assessment work, try to complete it a week in advance so you can at least leave it sit and then produce something, and, you know, reread it, proofread it, etc. And if things go really badly in the last week, unforeseen circumstances, at least you know that the work is already done. So if you're in that situation where the work is not yet done, think about trying to have it completed at least by the end of the weekend so that you've got a few days up your sleeve. While I'm speaking about the second assessment, does anyone have any questions, comments, feedback? Is anyone available to assist their classmates if somebody says, I really need some guidance? All right. Um, please feel free tonight to unmute your microphone, ask a question or use the chat facility to do so. Are there any questions about the unit so far generally? All good? All right. Let's go back to discussing interpretation of statutes and quick poll to get you working. What's the main piece of legislation relevant to the interpretation of statutes? What's the go-to piece of legislation? Ah, Emily, so quick. Did you anticipate the question? Acts Interpretation Act, 1901 Commonwealth. Is there a Queensland counterpart? Everyone's watching you now, Emily. So we've got to beat Emily. No, Rachel said yes. Glenn, well done. Acts Interpretation Act, you're one year out, I think, Glenn. Is it 1954? I think, I think it is. But, um, so the Acts Interpretation Acts, there's actually four, there's a, four, a suite of four acts that together constitute the interpretation of legislation suite. The Acts Interpretation Act in Queensland is by far the most important, but also there's the Legislative Standards Act, um, the Statutory Instruments Act, and the Reprints Act. Don't worry about too much about that for the moment. That's something that we cover in advanced statutory interpretation. So the Acts Interpretation Act, you need to have an understanding of that. Can I ask this, if um, you need to determine what is intended by legislation, what are some of the resources that are available to you to give you an idea of what it is that Parliament intended by introducing this legislation? What are some of the documents that go to assist you in interpreting? Rachel, very quick, you must have anticipated that as well. Rachel says the explanatory memorandum, which is what we use um, when we're referring to Commonwealth legislation. Catherine says bill, yes. Ra Rachel says also second reading speeches. Glenn says summary notes. So the whole range of things that you can consider and it's important that in your toolkit, I think, you incorporate some of these things as your go-to uh, places. 
So there are different ways that you can read legislation. Of course, you can read the legislation literally, and I'm not going to recommend this, but if you want, you could read it as if it is a novel, starting at the very first word and ending at the last word. I don't think anybody does that. So you've got to develop a technique of reading legislation that works for you. One of the important things is to consider the context of the provision, which means by its definition, to determine the context of a provision in a piece of legislation, you need to read more broadly, don't you? So my recommendation is always look at the index, look at the headings, look at the subheadings, look at the chapters, the parts, the sections from there. So have a, an overall perspective of what this legislation is about before you start to read the specifics. When you do read the specific legislation, you can read it literally. From that, you can determine whether you believe there is a single clear meaning. And if there is, and you've read that within context, that's probably the meaning that you can adopt. But when I talk about reading it within the context, I mean that you need to ask yourself this question. As I read this provision, literally, does, it, does its meaning change to some degree if I read it literally within the context of the legislation? So the context means, um, sorry, when you consider the context, it may mean that the literal meaning is altered as a result of that. You certainly need to consider the purpose of the statute. Now, it's all very well for me to say, you need to consider the purpose of the statute, and we've identified already some places where you can look to identify what that purpose might be. This is a favourite saying for judges. If you find yourself in front of a judge, the judge might say to you, what's your authority for that proposition? So if I ask you now as a class, please feel free to unmute the microphone or to use the chat facility. If you said to me that you need to consider the purpose of a statute to interpret it appropriately, and I said, what's your authority for that proposition? What would you say? Emily, I couldn't hear you, sorry. Project, project Skyblue. Yes, very good. Yes, it's always a go-to case. But is there some statutory provision that might assist you as well? I like your thinking, Project Blue Sky, always think about that. But are there statutory provisions that you can rely upon to argue that it is appropriate to consider materials to determine the context or the purpose? Ah, very good. Acts Interpretation Act, Section 15AA, Rachel says objects, clauses, preamble, long title. So <clears throat> when you're considering statutes, when you're interpreting statutes, it's important that you have something of a flow chart in your mind at least, a process, and that you have a leading case and you have a statutory provision where possible. And you don't need a whole lot more, not an introduction to law anyway. I urge you to look at the Acts Interpretation Act Commonwealth and look at section 15AB. I'll share the screen briefly. We've got a lot to cover, so I won't spend too much time on this. So here we have the Federal Register of Legislation. I'm sure that you've all looked at this um, website and gone exploring because it's very good. Acts Interpretation Act and um, section 15AB is the provision that deals with the use of extrinsic materials in the interpretation of an act. So that's what uh, you will need to consider. Um, and section 15AA, as I think Emily or Rachel mentioned, is also very important. One thing that's sometimes overlooked is the end notes to legislation. So if you look to the left-hand side of um, this Federal Register of Legislation, under Acts Interpretation Act, you'll see after part 11, the end notes. So what the end notes do is provide you with assistance 
in terms of information about the compilation and compiled law. So you can see that commentary on the right hand side. And the amendment history, which you'll see below, provides an account of how each section of the Act has been amended. And you can see that that is there. So the legislative history in EndNote 3 provides information about how each law has been amended um, or will amend the compiled law. The schedule provides you with a history of the development of the Act, and that's important when it comes to attempting to research legislation. Now, you'll find the information useful in two ways. The first is, obviously, so you're in a position to apply the law as it was at any given time. So, of course, if you're dealing with a criminal law matter, then you want to know what the law was at the time of the alleged commission of the offence. Now, the second is that it gives you an opportunity to consider why Parliament introduced the amendment. So you can go to the explanatory memorandum from in the Commonwealth from 1996 in the Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth um, Federal Register of Legislation or the explanatory note and the second reading speech, as the case may be, with respect to that um, legislation. So if we pan down, You'll see there in note three, which provides the legislative history in relation to various amendments to the Acts Interpretation Act. Um, all right. When um, reading legislation under an Act of Parliament, which is, um, you know, uh, sorry, when when reading about legislation that's been made under an Act of Parliament, such as regulations, it may be necessary also to refer to the relevant Act. So I mentioned earlier the um, supplementary pieces of legislation that might assist you in that regard. So you can go a little broader in your reading in terms of um, regulations, etc. But for the purposes of this unit, I think it's really important that you concentrate on statutes. So certainly in a Commonwealth level, the Acts Interpretation Act, which is the key piece of legislation. Can anyone tell me about treaties or international agreements and more particularly, whether they are binding on citizens within Australia? So we'll break that down. Yes or no, if Australia is a signatory to an international treaty, does the content of that treaty bind Australian governments and does it bind individuals? So let's have some votes, yes or no. All right, we're getting a mixture of answers coming in. The answer is generally no, so we'll give that one to Paul, but it may be. And can you think of why it would be that treaties may become binding on citizens in Australia? If the general rule is no, merely by entering into the treaty that doesn't bind the citizens, when might it bind the citizens? We'll give you a hint. Ah, uh, Paul's got it. When introduced into law by parliament, exactly. So the hint was, we're talking about statutes tonight. So um, those commitments that uh, the government makes by signing a treaty are not automatically part of our law, um, but they can become part of our law if parliament goes through another process. So um, the other thing that you might consider is other broad pieces of legislation that have a general effect. So at a Commonwealth level, from a criminal law perspective, the important pieces of legislation are the Crimes Act 1914 and the Criminal Code Act 1995, which has as a schedule to it, the Commonwealth Criminal Code. From a Queensland perspective, um, similarly, you might look at the Queensland Criminal Code and um, that is again a schedule to the Criminal Code Act. Sometimes you find important pieces of legislation are actually contained within a schedule to a very short 
piece of, um, of legislation. And so the schedule overwhelms the act itself, but the act introduces the schedule effectively saying this schedule, for example, the criminal code is now part of our law. Another um, thing that you might consider in the context of interpretation is interpretation principles that relate to contract. And in that regard, if you're considering interpretation of contracts, a key aspect is what we call an objective approach to interpretation. So can anyone tell me what is the counterpart to that which is objective? Very good. So Paul, Rachel, Chris, all almost a dead heat with Emily. Subjective, correct. So when we talk about looking at something from an objective perspective, what we're really saying is that we're looking at from the point of view of a reasonable person. What would someone outside the situation, but looking in as it were, think the parties are saying or doing as a result of their words or their actions? What the parties are actually thinking, their subjective intention, may not be relevant in all circumstances. And particularly when we're looking at contractual interpretation, it generally is the objective approach that we adopt in our interpretation. Sometimes we need to consider subjective elements, particularly, for example, in the prosecution of criminal offences where there's an intent element, then we have to work out what it is that this person was actually thinking. But generally, when we're looking at law, we adopt an objective approach. Has anyone come across some reading that might um, that you might associate with the word Clapham in this regard? That's a really that's a really obscure question. Clapham is, I think, a suburb of London. We're getting some no's. There's a famous case from one of the judges in the High Court in attempting to describe what we mean by the objective approach. Um, and the judge said something to the effect that the objective approach is what a reasonable person on the Clapham omnibus might think when viewing something from a distance. Um, I don't know why that sticks, but it just does. I forget the name of the case, but you might come across it, um, the Clapham omnibus. See, back in the 70s, we used to learn law in a very different way. So you get snippets of what we used to do. So um, when we're looking at interpreting contracts as opposed to statutes, some different rules apply. One of the things that you'll come across in contract law is in relation to the effect of verbal representations, promises, inducements. You'll also come across things like the parole evidence rule, which is essentially a rule to, to say that if the parties have reduced their agreement to writing, the intention is that everything that's important is reduced and recorded in that written document. So if something is alleged not to be part of the written agreement, then you might argue the parole evidence rule, um, but against that, you may argue that there were some uh, representations and inducements. So it becomes a gray area uh, in interpreting contracts, but keep those things in mind in a general sense. Another thing that you might consider is the fact that um, courts will, when interpreting contracts, for example, try to fill the gaps where something is missing. So when you're giving advice in relation to a contract, bear in mind that the courts may be prepared to fill the gap something that's missing, what do you think the test would be in relation to, or some of the things that the court might consider in determining whether or not to fill the gap when interpreting a contract? In other words, the courts might imply a term if satisfied of what things? 
Well, one is that the court might fill the gap, imply a term exists, even though it's not actually there, if the term is reasonable and it's fair. Another is that it's necessary. Another is that it goes without saying, of course, that was always the intention of the parties, it goes without saying. They, they might then be satisfied that it is expressed clearly and it is consistent with the expressed terms. So all of those things um, are necessary for a court to fill the gaps where a contract is otherwise uncertain. I've already provide you, I provided you, I think, with some information about redrafting skills. And um, remember, of course, that um, redrafting is likely to be something that you have to do in terms of modernising the approach. And it might be in any field of endeavour where you're given something that is poorly written, written in legalese, it's long, it's rambling, it's written in the passive voice, and you have to redraft that using an economy of words and plain language. Has anyone looked at past exam papers? If you have, you might have seen a few where I've actually put in some gobbledygook and asked you to redraft that during an exam. That's the sort of thing that I'm getting at. I won't get you to do an example now, but I think you get the idea. All right, so when we're undertaking our research, you need to, I guess, understand some of the basic terms is one thing. You need to have a systematic approach to your research and you need to have some understanding of the basic principles of statutory interpretation. Those of you that have got access to a computer now, and presumably that's pretty much everyone, unless you're on a phone, and even then you can do this, I'd ask that you take a moment to find and read section eight of the Queensland Civil Proceedings Act 2011. I'll just remain silent for a moment while you do that. If you're watching this as a recorded session, please find that piece of legislation. It's a very short sent section, and I'm gonna ask you some questions about it. When you've got it and read it, just give me a quick ready or something in the chat facility. So the, the name is the Civil Proceedings Act 2011. It's Queensland and we're looking for section eight. Civil Proceedings Act 2011. Have a read of it, then type ready. So we've got about six or seven people ready to go. A few more joining us now. Good. Those of you watching as a recorded session, hopefully you're ready to go. Okay, so let's go. Section eight, equitable damages. First thing you do is um, read that section within the context of the entire piece of legislation. To get an idea of what the Civil Proceedings Act is all about, where would you go? What would you look at? Any thoughts? Section three says Glenn, yes? Very good. 
Anything else? Anyone else wish to add something to the commentary? All right, where else would you look? In general terms, where else would you look? <clears throat> Headings, yes. So you'd look at the table of contents. Emily says the long title, yes. Where do you find the long title? Where do you find the short title? Okay, you might have a look at the end notes to get an idea of annotations. You might look at dictionaries. Explanatory note, thank you, Emily. So once you've done that and you've got a feel for the act and you've got an idea of what this act might be about, you've, had, you've considered the headings, you then go to um, section eight. Now, what part do you find, what's the, what part um, is section eight contained within? Part two, good. Right, so what's the heading? Law, Emily's got it. So the heading is law and equity. Law and equity. So what do we mean by equity? What's a very quick way of describing equity within the context of our studies? Fairness, says Paul. Fair, says Emily. Yeah, fair and just. Good. Now, when it says law and equity, does that suggest to you that there's a difference between law and equity? Does it remind you of the discussion we had some weeks ago about the way in which the law developed in a way that was strict, black letter law, then, then courts of equity, chancery, developed in England in the Middle Ages, and then in the late 19th century, the Judicature Act provided for a degree of merger between law and equity. So in the Civil Proceedings Act, we have some throwbacks here. They were joined later in life, says Paul, yes. So we have some, we have some reference here to law and equity. So when you look at the heading, you get some idea of what this section eight means. Now, section eight talks about equitable damages. So what's equitable mean? Probably what's fair, isn't it? What's damages? What's Damages is an example of what when we talk about law? What's the word that I'm chasing for? Compensation, yes. Settlement, yes. Money, yes all of those things. Even more broadly, damages is an example of a remedy, isn't it? So when you go to court, the key questions need to be asked and answered. Why are you here? What do you want? What's the basis for asking me to grant you that order? That's kind of the logic of a judge, isn't it? Who are you? Why are you here? What do you want? on what basis am I allowed to give you that order? So the order that you want in this instance is damages. Damages is the remedy that you seek in this instance. And what you're seeking is equitable damages, as opposed to what, what do you think might be the counterpart to equitable damages? Go back to the heading of the part. What's the contrast in this part to equity? Law, yes, Glenn, lawful damages. Okay, so you get a feel for it. So the heading gives you an idea of what we mean here. So we're talking about damages in equity, equitable damages. If a court has jurisdiction to hear an application, let's stop there. What do we mean by the word jurisdiction? What's a simple way of describing that? 
if someone has jurisdiction, it means they have. Paul, very quick. Any other answers? You're correct, Paul, but I'll just see if others have got it. If a court has jurisdiction, it has, yes, Emily. Paul says the right, meaning the right to hear the matter. Emily says, has authority. Yes, has authority to hear the matter. Gary says, the court can hear the matter. Yes, has the power, the authority, the capability, um, the right to hear the matter. Uh, Tani says, the, uh, the capacity to hear the matter. For example, a small claim. Exactly. So if you walked into the Mental Health Review Tribunal, and you asked for um, an injunction to stop someone from constructing a high rise building on a block of land next to you, you're not going to get very far, are you? Because the tribunal will go, why are you here? We have no, we have no jurisdiction. Likewise, if you went into the district court and asked for someone to be um, made subject to an involuntary treatment order uh, under the Mental Health Act, the court will say, why are you here? We don't, that's not our business. That's not our jurisdiction. You better go to the Mental Health Review Tribunal for that sort of thing. You know, do you understand what I mean? So don't take those examples literally. That's what I'm telling you is not right it's for illustration only. But jurisdiction means the ability to hear the matter. So if a court has jurisdiction to hear an application for certain things, then other things may follow. Hear an application for what? an injunction or specific performance? What are they? What's an injunction? What's a word for that? It stops an action. Yes, it stops something. To halt, says Christine. Thank you. Rachel was the first one with that. Rachel says specific performance forces an action to be completed. Yes. Gary says, Injunction is to stop something from happening. And Glenn says court appointed action. Yes, so all along those lines. So injunction is almost always prohibitory in nature, meaning to stop something, but it can be mandatory in nature to force someone to do something. So we do talk about injunctions generally as being to stop something, but sometimes a mandatory injunction is to force you to do something. Specific performance is to force you to, to do something. Specific performance is typically seen in the context of what type of action. If you're seeking an order for specific performance, very good, Rachel. Contract. So you're specifically, you seek to specifically perform a contract, usually for real estate, um, for example. So if a court has jurisdiction to hear a matter that involves a request for an injunction or a request for someone to be forced to, come to do something, then the court by virtue of section eight also has the power to award damages. Now injunctions and specific performances, performance are examples of what? In the same way that damages is an example of what? Put it this way, damages, injunctions, specific performance are all examples of court order says Gary, Rachel got the word I was after, remedies. Christine says outcomes, yes. Outcomes, court orders, remedies. So when we talk about remedies, this is really what it is that you want. You want damages, do you want an injunction? Do you want specific performance? Do you want a dissolution of marriage? Do you want whatever it might be? So that's the remedy that you're seeking. So if the court has the power to grant an injunction or specific performance, it may award damages as well. But what type of damages? Can we put a word in front of damages to make better sense of this section? What type of damages? Monetary compensation, yes. Lawful, says Glenn, yes. But I'm looking for a particular word, quantified, 
good, good guess. Not the word I'm after though. Punitive. Oh, that's a good one. But no, not what I'm thinking of. So you're all, yes, these are all correct answers, but they're not the answer I want. So therefore, ipso facto, they're wrong. <laughs> Is that right? Have a look at the section of the Act. What are we talking about in Section 8? What type of damages are we talking about in Section 8? Rachel said, but there are no wrong answers. Correct, Rachel. Equitable damages, Catherine. Thank you. Christine, equitable. Paul, yes, equitable. So when we look at the word damages within the context of this section, we're not talking about any type of damages. We're talking about equitable damages. And the hint is reinforced by the fact that injunctions and specific performance are remedies that are remedies at law or remedies at inequity. What, what is it? Is, is an injunction or specific performance an equitable remedy or a, a legal remedy? Paul says law, legal, law, law. Not the answer I'm looking for is the hint. Injunctions and specific performance are, Rachel's got it, equitable remedies. Equitable because they're fair. So if we think back historically, courts had the power to make an award of damages. In black letter law, you breach a contract, here's your, here's your remedy, here's your award, damages. Equity came in and said, well, we need to be more flexible, we need to be more fair. And injunctions, specific performance, were examples of equitable remedies. So given that we now know that injunction is a, an equitable remedy, specific performance is an equitable remedy, we now know that the court may also order what is essentially a legal remedy, damages, but in the context of an equitable jurisdiction. So if the court has jurisdiction to make equitable remedies, then it may award equitable damages, as well as, or instead of, an injunction or specific performance. So we see by looking at section eight, how it looks to be simple. It's only a few words, but it's actually a little more complex. And I trust that you'll appreciate that the purpose of in part in doing this now is to take it up a notch or two in terms of the level of sophistication of your learning in introduction to law. So we're just taking it slightly out of the bright and breezy, light and light and breezy category into something with a bit more substance. So I want you to be on top of this, the distinction between law and equity to some degree, just have a feel for it. In essence, you can make it very simple for yourself and you can incorporate this into your toolkit by looking at it from the perspective of the remedies. If you can identify various remedies and then categorise them as legal or equitable or both, then you'll go a long way to working backwards from there to identify the cause of action that you seek is legal or equitable or perhaps both. Or have I confused you and worried you or are we ready to embrace this and march on? All good? One year, as some um, for an exam question, I did actually put um, two students to explain to me what Section 8 means. So, uh, Chris, very good. Straight to the toolkit. <laughs> I like that. All right. Um, week 8 material relates to the theories of law and justice. There's no prescribed reading for this week, and um, Michael Kirby has a very good article in terms of judicial activism um, that you might like to consider. When you're thinking about um, legal um, theories of law and justice, you need to think about your legal thinking skills. So refresh your legal thinking skills. Um, have a look at the new lawyer about becoming a critical thinker. 
So critical thinking is a skillful judgment and you need to adopt certain skills to be a critical thinker. You should all know what we mean by interpreting, analysing, evaluating, explaining, and I'm sure that's all part of your toolkit. But I've mentioned that I think a few times now to look for the first word in a legal question that's asked of you during this degree so that um, you can answer the question properly because you understand the relevant critical skill that the examiner is asking you to provide. So legal analysis um, follows on from that. So what we're doing is we're putting together legal logic that we've already discussed. We're adding to that critical thinking skills. We're adding to that legal research. And from there, you're developing alternatives in terms of how to resolve a legal issue that's presented to you. Interpretation is all part of that. Okay, so do I take it that everyone understands what we mean by interpretation, analysis, evaluation, inference, explanation, um, or do I need to explain that? Would you like me to explain that in more detail? These are all the first words in possible assessments. So quick, quick poll. Do we understand those words and what they mean, yes or no? We're getting some yeses. Good. That's three yeses. Most of them, yes, yes. Go over them in more detail, a little bit more detail. Yep. All right, very quickly. Um, let's see. Interpretation. The ability to understand. Analysis, the ability to identify hidden features. Evaluation, the ability to assess. Inference, the ability to draw conclusions. Explanation, ability to communicate results. But do some independent research on that. And that's again, probably something in the toolkit, I would think, but that's a matter for you. Also in the toolkit, um, you might want to consider aspects of judicial activism. I mentioned the article by Michael Kirby in that regard. Um, the rule of law might be another thing. Does anyone know what judicial activism means? Just as a quick poll. You can unmute your microphone if you want. So what's judicial activism? Is there an example of judicial activism? You just type that into the into the um, chat facility if you like. Very good, Chris. Very good, Glenn. So the Marbo decision is, I think, the key example of judicial activism. It's basically where the judge, or more likely several judges in the High Court, reform the law um, by identifying that the law is unjust, obsolete, or defective. Um, it's more than just common law where the law is refined, judi judicial activism is like a reform as it, as it was in, in Marbo. The rule of law is part of our legal theory, independs all of our legal professional ethics, and it guides our political um, accountability. So you might have a look. Um, there are some very good resources on the rule of law, where to look. Um, one thing you could do, and I'm just trying to think of the legislation handbook is probably a very good one for you to consider. Let me see if I've got it catalogued in my section. Yeah, Queensland legislation handbook is probably useful. In general, I'll, I'll just share the screen. I'm not sure if I've shown you this previously, but um, in Queensland, we have the Queensland Legislation Handbook. It's part of the Department of Premier and Cabinet. You can download this, it's on the right hand side, or you can read this online and it provides a table of contents. It provides information about parliamentary process, subordinate legislation, etc. So um, what I was thinking of is down the bottom, it talks about 
fundamental legislative principles. There's an introductory comment there, the rights and liberties of individuals, um, for example. So that's the sort of thing that you might want to read and incorporate into your material if you're doing something about the rule of law, for example. Okay, so that's the Queensland Legislation Handbook. I'll stop the share now. All right, um, Emily says equal marriage rights as well, yes. Okay, so when you're um, considering the uh, material regarding legal research um, and updating your toolkit, there's plenty of material there available to you. And um, you'll need to consider something like the rule of law, judicial activism. Next week, we're going to kick off with some commentary in relation to access to justice. So I'm going to um, just run through this briefly now. Uh, again, there's no prescribed reading, but you will need to consider aspects of being committed to justice. And we'll talk next week about some specific areas that relate in general terms to human rights. So there is human rights law specifically. You'd be aware that the Human Rights Act is now um, introduced, but not effective, uh, not yet in force in Queensland. When we talk about access to justice that we'll be talking about next week, we'll um, consider criminal law briefly, an introduction. We'll talk about immigration law. We'll talk about human rights law. Something that we've touched on tonight, Briefly, mental health law. We'll talk about guardianship and administration, which is the imposition of substitute decision making for people with impaired capacity. We'll talk about child protection law, domestic violence law, to some degree environmental law, to some degree family law, then personal injuries law, and a brief commentary about anti-discrimination. So when we talk about access to justice, and the first topic would be being committed to justice. There's some of the examples of aspects of law that are relevant to um, being committed to justice. The reason I'm raising it is please do some preliminary research and reading in relation to that. There's no prescribed reading, so please read generally. Uh, give yourself a license to uh, explore and think about other discrete areas of law that you think have a bearing on the issue of access to justice and the implementation of um, justice generally. All right, well, we're gonna have an early night tonight. Thank you very much for your attendance, for your cooperation. Before we wrap up, are there any questions? I don't think anyone's been, has actually unmuted their microphone tonight, but maybe I'm wrong. All right. You're right, but uh, yes, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. So no questions, no comments. Okay. Um, I, sorry, I have a question. Yes, I know you touched briefly on it weeks ago, but I have a question. With there's a few of us that are starting to form study groups, and we just wanted to get your advice on collaboration versus inclusion, basically in things like sharing case notes. Certainly there's no problem with that. Um, in my view, um, collaboration and collusion can be, is fairly broad. Um, I'm fairly relaxed, relatively speaking, about that. Um, my, my main emphasis is that you work cooperatively with each other. So you can certainly share case notes, um, but what you've got to be careful about is you essentially using material of others without having acknowledged the authorship. So plagiarism is a huge part of it. And of course, you can't write material for each other. So for example, you can't um, write somebody's assessment or part of their assessment, but you can exchange ideas, materials, notes, um, commentaries. Um, you can discuss these matters. Um, so, I hope that helps, Emily, in terms of some general guidelines. But I think online, we do have some specific guidelines to consider under the um, CQU uh, section. Um, 
in terms of plagiarism. So if you haven't already found that, and I'm sorry I'm not pointing you directly to it, I'd encourage you to do so. Does that help to answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone else want to add anything to that? All right, so just on that, um, there is something from the Griffith University policy that I think was very good, and I hope Griffith don't mind that I'm referring to their policy, but collaboration is permissible in that a student may, and there's a um, number of things here, um, discuss with other persons the issues raised by the item of assessment. So you can do that. You can discuss with the other person possible means by which you address issues raised by that assessment. And you can share information, sources of information relevant to the um, item of assessment. But where, you, where you've got to be very careful and what you can't do is actually start to plan the format or structure of another student's assessment. Uh, what you can't do is write all or part of that student's other student's submission or, or for the assessment. Um, what you can't do is write all a part of um, uh, so, some other material um, that they then use as part of that assessment. Or, and what you can't do is provide a copy of your work for that assessment to say, here's what I did, what do you think? So I hope that gives you some general guidelines. All right, good. Thank you. Any other questions? All fine? Good. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attendance tonight. We'll see you this time next week. All the very best. Bye then.